My name is Michelle Phillips. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in sociology. I'm affiliated with Academia Sinica here in Taiwan. My project is called Repairing and Exploiting the Underclass Image. It is focused on migrant domestic workers from Indonesia and the Philippines going to Hong Kong and Taiwan to work as domestic workers. Uh, my project is focusing on the system of how these maids are brought to Taiwan and to Hong Kong and how that particular system leaves them vulnerable to abuse. Abuse is defined as financial abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or verbal abuse any of those four. I'm also focusing especially on the Indonesians and why the Indonesians seem to be um, consistently uh, more vulnerable to abuse than the Filipinas. And Taiwan and Hong Kong are considered the, the pinnacle in terms of rights and yet they still have an incredible amount of abuse and that's why I'm here. So even if even those that technically are the best in the world still have a lot of problems that means there is something fundamentally wrong with the system and again that's what I've found. Just the way the system works, it is set up to systematically disadvantage the domestic workers when they come to Taiwan or Hong Kong. And that just, that just means that they uh, have very few resources to fight back. Now, the government in Taiwan, the government in Indonesia, and the government in Hong Kong are trying to give them more resources to fight back, but it's a slow process. And my research is, uh, I, my research I hope will be used to bring really concrete recommendations to the governments. And I'm currently in consultations with the Filipino government, the Indonesian government, the Taiwan government, and the Hong Kong government about making some concrete changes to their laws and policies and regulations. I also have been sharing a lot of a Taiwanese culture with Indonesians and also vice versa, sharing a lot of Indonesian culture with the Taiwanese. A lot of that involved translation and and somehow when I started to explain just the underlying cultural assumptions, for example, um, Taiwanese people, uh, je Taiwanese people and Hong Kong people especially, tend to, uh, tend, tend to be more like critical and tend to so sometimes will shout their criticisms when they're alone in the home. Uh, it's just the nature of things because they want to be sure that, say, the, the domestic worker gets the point, that she learns from her mistake. However, in Indonesian culture, that's terrifying. In Indonesian culture, they never yell. That's probably the most disrespectful and worst thing you could possibly do. You always speak softly. You always speak in the passive. And when they hear their, their employer yelling at them, they're afraid it's a precursor to abuse. And so they clam up, they don't learn, and they dare not talk back. And so even if they didn't understand what the employer was saying, they never learn because they don't dare to respond. When I tell, that, tell them that, employers suddenly light turns on in their head and they understand why their domestic worker isn't learning from all their criticisms. It involved a court case that uh, was with a uh, foreign domestic worker uh, basically uh, suing her agency because she was being overcharged. She was being charged way too much um, that was illegal for the Indonesian government and illegal for the Taiwan government. And she wanted that debt cancelled because it was illegal as it was and she wanted to be compensated for all the extra trouble that the agency had put her through in, as she had fought with them to try and get that debt canceled in terms of going to court and having to hire a lawyer and other things like that. So I met, I met with them when they went to court and I happened to meet with the lawyer there and while this maid is really good in Chinese, she's not entirely fluent and so I was, I, in court I was helping to translate between her and the, the lawyer. I was able to speak to the domestic worker fully in Indonesian and understand her case and how everything was going and I was able to translate that to the lawyer as well as show the lawyer how all the proof worked as well as explain a lot of the laws that are in Indonesia that deem this illegal. I wasn't able to make it to the second court case unfortunately I was in Hong Kong at the time but the lawyer did ask me to translate documents like the domestic workers uh, statement as well as the documents that she signed while in Indonesia, as well as the text messages between the maid and her agency back in Indonesia. I also had to explain to her a lot of these subconscious meeting and a lot of the undertones that the agency was conveying to her. And for example, the agency was actually threatening her even when the language didn't suggest it. And uh, well, because of, because of that help, uh, the domestic worker won the first round. I just needed to have um, have some way of spending a year abroad to get enough data for my dissertation. 
Fulbright was a great way to do that, as well as opening quite a few doors for me in terms of um, the governments and prestige and things like that. Because I think it is partly because I was a Fulbright scholar that now I'm able to speak to the Filipino, Taiwanese, Hong Kong, and Indonesian governments and that they are in ways willing to listen to what I have to say.